Ladies and gentlemen, as last year's treasurer and the moderator of tonight's event, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you and to introduce to you our distinguished speakers, Master John Dyson, our treasurer in 2017, and Master Rosalia Bella, who until 2021 was the Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada. Before I hand over to them, I would like to give you a few words by way of introduction. Master of Bella have had an extraordinary life. For those of you who were lucky enough to have attended the Inn's Amity visit to Canada in 2018, you will have heard her wonderful moving speech about her journey to Canada's highest court. There was hardly a dry eye in the house. Rosalia Bella was born in a displaced persons camp in Stuttgart, Germany. Both her parents survived the Holocaust. Her father, Jacob Silberman, was liberated from the Theresienstadt concentration camp, and her mother, Fanny Silberman, survived Buchenwald concentration camp. Her father had studied law at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, and after liberation, he was appointed head of legal services for displaced persons in the US zone of Southwest Germany. In 1950, her family arrived in Canada. She had been determined to be a lawyer from a very early age, and she fulfilled that ambition by beginning her studies at the University of Toronto, and she was a call to the Ontario Bar in 1972. When she was 29 years old, she became Canada's youngest ever and indeed first pregnant judge. She was appointed to the Ontario Family Court in, 1990, in 1975. Nine years later, in 1984, Master Abella served as the sole commissioner of the Federal Royal Commission on Equality and Employment. In 2004, she became the first Jewish woman and refugee to sit on the Canadian Supreme Court bench. I am delighted to say that she became a bencher of this inn in 2017, and she retired from the Supreme Court in 2021. Following her retirement, Master Abella has served as a visiting professor at Fordham University and at Harvard Law School. And if that was not enough, like Master Dyson, she is a talented pianist, having graduated in 1964 from the Royal Conservatory of Music in classical piano. Now, Master Dyson also comes from a Jewish family. His mother was Bulgarian and his parental grandparents were Lithuanian. He studied the piano with the renowned Dame Fanny Waterman. He went on to study classics at Wadham College, Oxford. He was called to the bar in 1968 and took silk in 1982. He was elected a bencher of the inn in 1990. And from 1998 until 2001, he served as the presiding judge of the TCC. And from 2001 until 2010, as Lord Justice of Appeal. In 2010, he was appointed a Justice of the Supreme Court. And from 2012 until 2016, he was Master of the Rolls. As many of you will know, Master Dyson was the treasurer of this inn in 2017. And indeed, it was he that called Master Abella to the bench. Following his retirement, he has written two books, Justice, Continuity and Change in 2018, and A Judge's Journey in 2019. I can commend them to you very much and enjoyed reading them. Never Idle, he has returned to 36 Essex Chambers, where he has a busy practice as an arbitrator and a mediator. He is also a visiting professor at both Queen Mary and University Colleges London. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome tonight Masters Abella and Dyson.
Thank you very much, Andrew. I'm, I'm sure that uh, I speak on behalf of uh, Rosie. I'm going to call Rosie Rosie because that's how I know you uh, when I uh, say how uh, grateful um, I am, we are, for, the, for what you've just said. Um, before I, as it were, open the batting with a conversation, and I emphasize that it was Rosie who was insistent that she didn't just do a repeat of her wonderful lecture in, in Canada, but she wanted to have a conversation. And she wanted to have a conversation with me uh, in which we would talk about various issues of common interest. Your glittering career is well known throughout the common law world. Uh, I think you must hold the world record for the number of honorary degrees. And I think you're probably still collecting but my, my understanding is that you've achieved something approaching 40 honorary degrees, which is truly remarkable. Uh, those who heard your Middle Temple uh, lecture at, at that Amity visit that um, uh, Andrew Hochhauser mentioned, uh, and sadly I was unable to be there myself, but will never forget it. I have read the lecture, the passion and the compassion spring off the pages, and so how much more uh, moving it must have been to actually be there and hear, hear you um, talk. Rosie and I were first introduced to each other by Lord Walker, Robert Walker of Guestingford. Um, and Robert uh, led a legal exchange to Canada a little while after that. Uh, and I was fortunate in, enough to be on that um, delegation. And uh, Rosie was on the Canadian team. And I mention this only because I think it gives you a real insight into her, her personality, her char character. We arrived rather tired on the Friday and uh, she was horrified that no arrangements had been made to feed and water the, the visiting delegation from the UK. And so she set to work, she invited us to uh, the kitchen of their flat and she, had, she herself cooked and prepared a meal for us because being a good Jewish mother, the idea of us going without food, in particular food, uh, was, was horrifying. So, but that does tell you quite a lot about, about Rosie as a person. We also um, were involved together in a, a, a very memorable, for me, visit to Krakow, Krakow uh, in 2015 at an event which was uh, arranged to mark the 70th anniversary of the Nuremberg war, war crimes trials and the 80th anniversary of the passing of the dreadful Nuremberg race laws. Uh, and we had um, a, a really very interesting and moving uh, day's conference. And then, and I know this, this was an event which uh, was searing so far as Rosie was concerned because it was held, the event was held at the Jagiellonian University the very university that her father, as you've just heard, uh, attended and I think uh, taught at. And I know Rosie gave a, a lecture to the students of that university. And then the other time that we worked together was a little later when we were both invited to Jerusalem to uh, an event uh, to mark the, I think it was the 70th anniversary of the Israeli Supreme Court. Uh, and the, the topic uh, of the day conference was the importance of the independence of the judiciary. And I remember vividly um, giving a, um, a, a lecture on that subject, which I thought was quite good, but it was a bit worthy. Uh, and um, it, it lacked perhaps something of passion and humanity, uh, but it was on the subject of the independence of the judiciary. Rosie gave a most fantastic speech, um, which, I hope she'll forgive me for saying this. I didn't think it had an enormous amount to do with the independence of the judiciary, but it had everything to do with human rights, equality, and all the subjects which are so very dear to her heart. And uh, one could feel the, the, the movement in the atmosphere of the audience, something which I, I don't think that my lecture managed to achieve at all. Anyway, I just thought I'd start off by saying a few words um, about um, how the two of us have got to know each other. And I regard Rosie as now a very close friend. And, and I, I'm full of admiration for everything that she has achieved. 
But I'm going to start the conversation now uh, by um, asking you um, why you decided to come to the law, because I understand that you decided to become a lawyer when you were about four. Is that, is that right? It is. But before we go into my boring childhood, uh, can I just say how honored I am to be able to be here through the magic of technology, which I have never been able to master and I think will never master. But to be able to see you and hear you um, under Andrew's very generous uh, support, the Middle Temple, is, is extraordinary to me. I can't believe we've made it this far. And that our friendship, as you described the connecting dots, um, has led us to today where we can talk to each other and to the members of the Middle Temple about two very different careers, but very similar values, I think. I mean, as I, as I listen to you talk, and uh, my passion is only because I'm a girl and Canadian, and we're allowed to be more progressive. You are as passionate as anyone I know, but it, it's done in a very British way, understated, but it's demonstrably there for those who listen to your words. Uh, but it's also the intelligence, John, that you, you bring, and not just intelligence. I mean, lots of people know many things. You have wisdom, which is a harder thing, I think, to be able to find, knowing what to do with, with the facts and with, um, with the circumstances in order to come out with, a, with an outcome that is just, uh, rather than just knowing what the rules are. So the friendship with you and Jackie that uh, Itchy and I have is something we cherish deeply. And here we are on a Monday evening. Um, I'm in New York, you're in London. And, and it's a miracle that we're able to have this conversation, both, both with the shared passion for law and justice, I think. It goes without saying, it's what's bonded us. So why did I, why did I become a lawyer? Well, Andrew very generously went through the CV and talked about how young I was when I decided to become a lawyer. And it was because one of my earliest memories when we came to Canada in 1950 was my father who, as Andrew said, had been, uh, he taught himself English in Germany and had um, applied for a job with the American, the Allies, passed the test and served in the capacity of organizing legal service for displaced persons. So when we came to Canada in 1950, and it took us a long time to get in, and some of you may know the story about how Canada's anti-Semitic immigration policies kept Canada uh, free of Jewish immigrants from 33 to 48. And uh, Irving Abella, my brilliant husband's book, None is Too Many, documents the story. But when he came to Canada in 1950, when we were finally allowed in, he went first to the Law Society and said, tell me what tests I have to write in order to be able to become a lawyer here. I've just practiced law with the Americans. And they said, you can't, because to practice law, you have to be a citizen. And of course, in Canada at the time, it was five years before you got to be a citizen. He had his wife, uh, my grandmother, and my younger sister and me to support, so we became an insurance agent. That was the moment. I was four years old. It's one of my earliest memories in Canada, one of my earliest memories, period, of deciding I was going to be the lawyer that he couldn't be. Because even then it felt so wrong to me that he couldn't be what he wanted to be. But in our house, John, two things happened. One was, they encouraged me in this ridiculous dream of a girl being a lawyer, because in Canada, girls weren't lawyers. They just weren't. But the second thing that happened that was remarkable to me looking back on it now that I'm a parent, was that he never, they never complained about what had happened to them in the war. He never said, isn't this awful? I'm not able to be what I spent eight years uh, getting a degree for. And he finished four years at Jagalonian and then two years clerking for a Supreme Court, for a <laughs> Court of Appeal judge, two years articling, eight years. Never heard him complain that he couldn't be what he was trained to be. He just felt lucky that he was alive. So that was my dream. 
That was my dream, to fulfill his goal without having the slightest idea of what it meant to be a lawyer. Not a clue, I'm four. And all the way along, when people said, what do you want to be? And when they asked girls what they wanted to be in the 50s, everywhere, what they meant was, when do you want to get married and have children? And I did want to get married and have children. I was Jewish. That was kind of a given that you would get married and have children. But they all said, girls aren't lawyers. You can't do this. But my parents said, why not? So that was the goal. I was going to be a lawyer. And that's all I ever wanted to be, was a really good lawyer. And what finally connected for me, being a lawyer in, in justice, was reading Les Miserables when I was 13. That showed me the idea of someone spending 19 years in jail for stealing a loaf of bread to help his nephew who was sick was astonishing for me, but it also triggered the idea of uh, this is what injustice feels like. I am on a track to prevent people from injustice. So I never wavered. I never wavered. There were almost no women in my law school class. I didn't care. I wasn't there for what the world thought. I was there to vindicate my father's dream of what he wanted to be. And then it became his and my mother's dream that I should be what I wanted to be. So it happened. Uh, and I never, never, never regretted this chutzpah in wanting to be something that girls weren't supposed to be. Why did you become a lawyer? Well, I, I wish I could claim that my route to the law was as, as wonderful as, as yours and as so steadfast. Um, I, uh, I didn't decide to become a lawyer until well, my, my route to the law was a was, was a, not a very steady route. Um, I, I studied uh, classics at school. I got a scholarship to go to Oxford um, to, as, as a classics scholar, but uh, with a view to reading law. Now, why reading law? Because I, I think I, my father always wanted me to be a lawyer. Uh, and I didn't have any particular views about what I wanted to be at all. I didn't really... I didn't uh, ha have any particular goals or dreams. Um, I, I was just sort of carrying on. Um, when I was interviewed by the warden of my college at, at Oxford, he said to me, uh, well, if you're going to be a lawyer, why do you want to study law at the university? You may say that was the most crazy question to ask me. Yeah, but I think basically, so. Basically, he, he said, um, if you're going to be a lawyer all your life, well, then why, why not study something different? Uh, at university and he said you're good at classics that latin and greek and so on so do that now the warden of my college was, was a great man sir maurice barra and he was he was a big man in all senses and very powerful and i was a very naive uh, inexperienced uh, boy and so faced with this powerful question from the great man i'm afraid i i caved in and so i stayed with my classics uh, and I could have swapped halfway through and, and, and done law, but I, I did enjoy the classics enormously. Uh, and in fact, so much so that I seriously considered being an academic in classics, Greek history, ancient Greek history. And my tutor at Oxford said to me, if you want to be an academic, then I would certainly um, encourage you to do that. But my advice to you is don't do it unless you have such a passion for it that you think it's the only thing you want to do with your life and I, but that was code i think for saying this is a very hard uh, path to, to, to tread um and so there are not many openings and so on so i had to look at myself in the mirror and i did not feel that i had such a passion for classics and and so that was very good advice so i then thought well i then decided well i i thought of other things like the civil service but in the end, it was almost by a process of elimination. But I think with the thought in the back of my mind that my father, who had a, was a bit romantic about the law, he, he used to go and watch uh, the great QCs of the day uh, doing, weaving their magic with, with juries in the criminal court. He was a bit romantic about it all. So I think maybe a bit of that rubbed off onto me. So that's how I got, I'm afraid it's, it's nothing like as 
dramatic uh, or, or single-minded as your route. Uh, and um, well, that's it, really. That, and and we, we haven't got time to go into all the details of how, how I progressed from there. But, but don't you think, John, that having had a different background helped you be a lawyer? I, I've always thought that linear approaches to life do not lend themselves to good lawyering. You have to really be able to understand different contexts because law is a series of rules that apply differently in different contexts. So you had classics instead of just straight rule education. And that expanded your mind into directions it would not otherwise maybe have gone. Um, I, I'm just, you're, you're a polymath and it shows in the kind of lawyer and judge you are because you have a broad set of interests, music, literature, um, culture, and that made you, a, I'm convinced that made you a better lawyer. And I know that made you one of the great judges of your generation because you were so open to so many things in life that you understood what your job as a judge was. Well, I'm not, I'm not a, a very good at uh, examining myself and my, and my motives. And it's very kind of you to say all those sorts of things. Um, but I do think that my, my uh, classical background, in particular, uh, the Latin and the Greek, did um, it probably played to the sort of person I was anyway, but it, it really did require a very, very accurate, careful use of language. I've always been passionate about being uh, precise and clear in my use of language, and, and I take a lot, I've always taken a lot of trouble in the way I express myself. But the sort of lawyer that you ha have been pre preeminently and that I, I have aspired to be to some extent, uh, um, which is um, a humane lawyer uh, who, who has uh, a, a really fundamental uh, search for achieving fairness and justice. Um, I don't know how that has really come about. Um, I thought about this a lot. And I, I wondered whether subconsciously the um, experiences as a Jew, and of course you've had more direct experiences of this kind than I have, but I have had, I had experiences indirectly. Uh, my grandmother uh, was uh, for six months in Bergen-Belsen uh, in 1944, uh, she she would hardly ever talk about it, and I didn't really understand what it was all about. It was only gradually that I learnt about it. Uh, um, my family, like I'm sure your family, I know your family, has been uh, savagely uh, affected by the Holocaust. Uh, various members of my family were murdered. Again, I didn't know about that until a lot later in life but I have often wondered whether my experience in that regard and, and also experience as a, as a Jew in this country but although I've, I've not experienced uh, anti-semitism directly uh, I've seen it I've seen anti-semitism uh, directed at other people uh, in a rather shocking way but I've been I've often been aware of anti-semitism in a in a low-level way in this country. On the whole, people know that, know that it's, it's unacceptable, and so they, they tend not to come out with it. But I, I'm still slightly conscious of, of all of that. And I've wondered whether all of that put together has affected the, my life view, if you like, and my view about, um, about uh, suffering and, and um, injustice and, and all that kind of thing. I don't know whether whether you've ever thought about how, because I know you, you are passionate about justice uh, and equality. Uh, that's what you're known for more probably than anything else. Uh, have you thought about, you must have done, what, what, what's the explanation for that? I don't think there's any doubt uh, that being, not, not just being Jewish, uh, being Jewish in an environment that is not Jewish, uh, standing out, uh, and I mean, I stood out because I was 
first of all, a woman. I was not like the other members of the legal profession in Ontario when I graduated in 1970. So I was already different. And I dressed like the women in the early 70s and, and went into court with short skirts and high heeled boots and I long dangling earrings. I was a woman of my times, but I was also, um, I became increasingly aware different because I was Jewish because most members of the profession were not. It was a very white Anglo-Saxon world, but they were, they were wonderful and they were welcoming to me. And I never really thought too much about my, my background. It was just a given, it was who I was. Uh, because the household was such a happy one. It was quite ironic that of all the kids I knew and I went into, into all of their homes, mine was the happiest house I knew. My parents were very upbeat. They were very optimistic. They were very encouraging. Um, it wasn't like many of the Holocaust homes where there are demons and it's a repressive environment. So they pushed me to go out and explore. I think it was the Royal Commission that really kind of put me in touch with the, with the Holocaust background, which I never denied, but never uh, was preoccupied with. And it was traveling across Canada and meeting with disabled people and persons uh, of color and uh, indigenous people, women, and talking to them about the experience of discrimination they faced in Canada, because the purpose of the Royal Commission was to address barriers in employment for those who were different. That really was what got me thinking about, well, how different was I really? I knew I was different because I was a woman, but was it my Jewishness that really made me different? And I, and I decided that it was. It's what gave me the fuel. It's how I thought about the world. It didn't direct me to a particular answer, but it left me in a constant state of unwillingness to accept the status quo as it was, because it worked for people who had a lively sense of entitlement. But when you're people like us, then it's more a sense of opportunity. Will I have the chance? Will I be given the opportunity to fully be what I think my talents can be, even though I am Jewish, even though I am female? So that didn't really click until my late 30s. And then it became a full passion, making sure that for others, there were no barriers to their fulfillment based on how different their identities were. Uh, now, where does it leave me now? It leaves, I'm in a constant state of rage having come from that experience, having been born in a displaced persons camp in 1946 about what's going on in the world now as a lawyer and as a judge. And what enrages me is we were supposed to have fixed all of that with law, with the Declaration of Human Rights, with the Convention Against Genocide, with the United Nations. Um, that was all supposed to be behind us and we were moving forward into a collaborative consensus about what justice in the world meant. And here we are, how many years later? Since the end of World War II? and the impunity and the bullying and the massacre is ongoing, notwithstanding law, aside from how outrageous it is that people are wringing their hands and nobody seems to know what to do because the risks of course are catastrophic the other way, but the risks are catastrophic mm -hmm. this way too. What it says to me is what's wrong with my chosen profession? with law, that it is not able to do what law is supposed to do, and that is to protect people from injustice. So it's, and that definitely has its roots in what I come from. And it makes me very passionate and very frustrated and very angry because I just don't know how to deal with it, how to process it in my mind, that we are tolerating these massacres for almost two months now. So don't you find it, I mean, we're, we're justice warriors, lawyers. I too am a romantic about law. And I know there's a role for diplomacy, but you can't come from what we've come from and not feel as a sense of 
bereavement at the global order and horror at what's become of it. What do we do now? Where, where are all of those things we put into place not to repeat all of that? That's why I became a lawyer to fight injustice uh, in my small way. Every lawyer does it case by case. And judges do it justice as they can case by case as well. But this is, we're part of a, of a justice world as lawyers and judges. And we have watched judicial independence go down the drain in countries. We've watched massacres in countries. And now we are seeing again what we saw in Syria. So I don't know, John, I feel proud to be a lawyer and a judge, but I despair over the limits of my chosen profession to do what I always believed law should be able to do. And that is set up fences around injustice with enforcement mechanisms to make sure they don't happen. But, you know, maybe we need a Bretton Woods to think about human rights the way we did after the, the Second World War about a global economy. Uh, something, something needs to happen. So I'm very proud of, of the fuel that I got from where I came from, but it's also led me to a very unhappy place now because I'm, I'm so frustrated at my inability with all the tools that I have as a lawyer and as a judge to be able to do anything but watch in horror at what's happening. You must well, feel the same. I, I, of course I feel the same, um, but what we are, well, I feel completely helpless and, and I'm, I'm sure you do too. But can I take, take you back um, to earlier in your life? You, um, you, you became a, an, an advocate, and I'm not, we were barrister, I'm not sure what the correct term is for what you were, but a practicing lawyer at any rate. I was. Uh, for, for four years. Um, and was that in private practice? I was in private practice. I did whatever came in the door. Yeah. I did a lot of legal aid. I did criminal work. I did corporate work. I did real estate. I did family law. I did everything. Yeah. Like, like me. I, I, I did everything to start did with you? as well. Yes. But you uh, left the, the bar after only four years and became a judge, I think. Yeah. Um, and I, th that, that would not happen in, the, in, in our country. Um, it, it, didn't happen, yeah, it didn't happen in ours either, John. I think they just really needed to happen. It was 1976. It was the year after International Women's Year. I think they were desperate to find a woman to put on the bench because women's groups were screaming about how there were no women on the bench. And so they looked around and I think I was the only one they could find, but it wasn't a choice, it wasn't a decision. I didn't say, gee, I've been practicing law for four years, I'm ready to be a judge. They asked me, so I said, yes, I didn't even know any judges at the time. Right, well, that's very interesting because I, I occasionally meet people, uh, young people who say, I want to be a judge. And I, I always find that slightly strange. Um, but then I shouldn't say that because on the continent, of course, uh, judges are a professional class who start as baby judges and they work their way up the ladder. So, but we're, we're, we're so used in the common law system to judges largely being drawn from successful advocates. Your, your career in that respect was, was unusual because of what you've just described. Uh, if you hadn't been approached, you would have carried on, I imagine, uh, as uh, an advocate building up your practice. And then at some point, like I did, you would have then, you would have considered um, a judicial career. Did you, along the way, have a moment where you thought, now I'm ready to be a judge? No, I, I never, I, I I never, as far as I can recall, I was building up my practice, um, a successful practice. I was enjoying it. I enjoyed the cut and thrust of, of advocacy. I, I found um, persuasion, persuading judges, I found that really very rewarding. I, I mean, th th this is genteel warfare, or maybe not, not always genteel, but anyway, warfare. Uh, and I'm afraid to say I actually quite enjoyed all that. Um, but uh, but in those days, 
uh, successful barristers uh, were um, were given an opportunity if they wanted it to become uh, part-time judges just well really from their point of view just to find out whether they liked it and whether they might be any good at it and so that's what happened to me and, and I started uh, as what was then called an assistant recorder doing very small um, uh, criminal cases but my very first case in, with a jury uh, was the, the trial of somebody for for stealing 20, 20 pieces, which is was about four pounds. And that for that momentous charge, there was a, a jury trial. And I found that actually that I, I really enjoyed judging. I found it very rewarding. I found something very satisfying about uh, trying to resolve problems, uh, to resolve problems uh, uh, effectively and fairly always so important that everybody should feel that they've had a, a fair hearing and, and that I think is, is itself really interesting because I, I mean all good judges have to be able to conduct fair processes uh, but not all judges are successful at that and in our system which from in which the the highest judges, well, the high court judges are drawn from, on the whole, the leading practitioners, although it's become a bit less so in recent years. But there's been this kind of uh, almost um, assumption that if you're a very good barrister, then you'll be a very good judge. And I never understood that assumption at all. It seems to me uh, nonsense. But in fact, a lot of very good barristers have turned out to be very good judges. But what do you think about that as a as a, a system for choosing good judges? I mean, because the, the profession of an advocate is very different from the profession of a judge. Oh, it's completely different. And the roles are different and your responsibilities are different and your accountability is different. I mean, it was almost liberating to become a judge because as a lawyer, you're sitting across from somebody who is looking to you to make his or her world right again. And the responsibility is huge and it's personal, I found. Uh, when you become a judge, you hear both sides. There's a, a catharsis in a way to being able to evaluate both positions. And you also don't know in the same intimate way who these people are. It matters to you, but in a, in a totally different way. But the, the more interesting question to me, John, is how you pick, what is the pool from which you pick judges? And, and England, of course, has had brilliant judges and brilliant barristers. Um, it's also a country which is not known for a lot of change. I mean, the, you know the light bulb joke, how many lawyers does it take to change a light bulb? Change. You know, the, what's wrong? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And it works for me, so it must work. But Fish don't know that water is wet and you have to look at what it looks like to the outside. The fact that you are really brilliant at defending one position doesn't necessarily mean that you will have the judgment, the compassion, or the courage to be able to judge wisely. You may know the law and you may know the rules, but I don't think it's a guarantee that you will be a good judge. So I think there are professors who would be very good um, and have been good judges if, if the pool were expanded. I think there are public servants who would be excellent judges and, and it's important to have that point of view represented as well because um, they see a different side of the legal system. It, it's far more linear, I think, if you're a barrister and you're working on the details of each case uh, than where you're in a position where you have to see the bigger picture. And judging is bigger picture. It's the, it's the details of the case before you, but it's the bigger picture. Plus the fact that it excludes people, it did in England, certainly for a while, uh, women, non-whites, people who didn't tend to get uh, the same access into the, into the advocacy route as other people. So this is, not a, this is not to denigrate anybody's quality, but it's to say, you have to think about why the system has been the way it is and whether it can't be improved or enhanced by opening the route 
to people who are different from the usual, um, the usual candidate. So I agree with you. I don't know what there is about being a brilliant lawyer that makes you an automate an automatic candidate for a brilliant judge. You may be brilliant is good. Knowing knowing law is great. I mean, you have to have that. But being being a compassionate person, being empathetic, being able to listen to the other side, being able to understand that you have your own prejudices, prejudices, but that you're you're able to transcend them and listen to what's in front of you instead of top down. Advocates tend to be top down. You know, they have an idea of what the right answer is and then they proceed. Well, that isn't, as you know, the best way to be a judge. You've got to put your own views aside and listen from the ground up. So is that, but that's changing, isn't it, in, in England now? It is changing, but very slowly. Um, I mean, to, to me, the, one of the biggest differences is that the, the advocate's job is to, to try to win the case. I mean, clearly, within the constraints that, that he, has to he or she has to operate under. Um, but but basically, it's the job of the advocate to win the case for the, the advocate's client. The, the, the judge's job is completely different from that. And one of the, you said you, you use the word liberating. I totally agree with that. I mean, one of the liberating uh, features I found of being a judge was that you no longer um, had to worry about who won the case. Your job was to, to the best of your ability, get to the right answer. Um, in a fair way, so that in particular the person who lost the case felt that they'd had a fair hearing. Uh, and, and you didn't really mind who won the case. And there are some, I mean, I, I think that's essential, but I know there, there, there certainly have been judges who very much minded who won the case because they had a very strong view about, about the merits of the case. And some judges, I'm sure you've heard this and maybe have seen it, but some judges would uh, wrap up um, their findings with findings of fact in, with a view to trying to make them appeal proof because they had a very strong view of where the justice of the case lay and they didn't really mind what, what rules they broke in order to get there. I mean, I'm perhaps possibly exaggerating a little bit. Um, but I, I, I mean, I see the time and we are, we are a bit limited. Sadly, I could go on talking to you uh, for a long time and there are a whole host of topics that we haven't had time to cover but I think that uh, if um, uh, Master Hockhauser is is there uh, I, I, is he there? I am can you, you are, see well, me? No we can't see you but we no, can, I can hear see you. you now can see you now but I'm just wondering uh, Andrew whether given that we've we've got to finish at about 7 15 I understand that if there are questions that people would like to have uh, um, put to us, whether we should give the, whether we should now move over to the question and answer phase. If there are no questions or we've run out of questions, then Rosie and I, I'm sure we'll have no difficulty in filling out the rest of the time. Well, what I would like to do, because I'm sure that once some questions start being put, there will be more that will follow on their heels. Uh, I have a couple of questions I would like to ask you myself, and there's one that's been posted that I would be interested to your answer on. Um, my first question to you is this. Um, looking back on your respective judicial careers, what would you single out as your greatest achievement? John? Gosh. Um, my greatest single achievement. Uh, I, I, I would love to be able to point to a, a particular decision of mine, uh, which I think has made a real difference. The, the, the only ones that spring to mind are rather boring procedural decisions, which is, I, I don't really want to go into, but they, they were very important. Um, I, I, I gave lots of judgments in, in the human rights field and public law and so on. But I can't think of one immediately, which is a kind of Donahue and Stevenson type uh, decision. Uh, I think that I, I would like to think that my, my time as master of the roles uh, made a, 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 I made a big impact on 
uh, on that court and what it did. And I know that my time, although I didn't realize this at the time, but I, somebody's written, a, uh, an academic's written a book about uh, the Supreme Court and to my surprise said that I had actually been extremely influential in, in and quite a number of decisions in the Supreme Court, which through my, what started out as I thought going to be dissenting judgments, persuaded others to come on board and therefore became the leading judgment. So I don't think I can um, identify any particular thing that I can uh, point to as, as, as being so influential. I think it's more a, 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 an accumulation of, of things. Well, I have to say, I think that's typically modest. Um, Rosie, what would you point to? I, I just want to say that John's answer probably highlights what may be the most important quality a judge should have, and that is humility. You know, the willingness actually to understand that we are not omnipotent. This is why I'm a great believer in mandatory term limits. When my 75 years came up on July the 1st, I thought, thank goodness we don't have what's going on in the United States with judges having to decide what's a good time to go, what's a bad time to go, politicizing the whole process. So uh, John's humility is really a beacon. It's, that's the most important thing to remember. We are judges and people look up to us. They look up to the position. Um, and John's modesty is why they also look up to him. So what, what am I proudest of? You see, for me, that's a, that's a different kind of question. I have many decisions that I'm proud of. I am particularly proud of the fact that the Royal Commission report in 1984 ended up being the, the seeds of what the Supreme Court of Canada decided equality means for Canada. And I'm proud of it, not just because when you do a Royal Commission, you have no expectation that it's ever gonna get implemented, but because the case involved somebody who was denied uh, the ability to practice law in Canada because he wasn't a citizen. And they struck down the provision, the citizenship requirement, uh, which had kept my father out of the practice of law, using my words. My father died a month before I finished law school. So he never got to see anything that happened. But um, the intellectual contribution of being able to do that and in a way give him the gift of uh, saying thank you. You see, we've helped the country that let us in. They, they. Ah, we've lost. We've lost Rose's connection. Sorry, are we back? Yes, you are. So, so let me tell you. Aside from cases, um, and I found the hardest to be the family court cases because for seven years I was deciding whether to take other people's children away. And it was, as John said, the first lower level of courts that everybody said, don't do it. It's the lowest level. You'll never, you'll never be a really important judge. But I learned how to judge by listening to people and deciding whether to take their babies away when I had two of my own at home. Um, so that was the hardest judging I ever did. But what I am proudest of is I didn't know any mothers who were lawyers in 1973 when we had our first son. And I was appointed to the bench when I was seven months pregnant with our second son. This to me was an experiment. I had no idea how this was gonna work out. And I never gave any interviews about, you know, the work-life balance nonsense, which simply does not exist. I mean, I had a husband who was a professor and we used his salary for childcare services. We could afford both of us having careers, uh, but I never knew how it was gonna end up. And it was only when I was 75 and could say to people, this experiment worked out and these are two really nice people who have come out of this process. I am proudest of that than anything else that I have done because it was by no means predictable to me. And they're both lawyers. So, I mean, it, it is, it is my, my greatest joy to be able to say I didn't mess them up by having this wonderful career. Well, now, can I take turn the clock back and ask you, if you had the chance to do something differently as you went through your career, what would it be? I, I never regret anything, nothing. 
I never looked back. I never, I didn't expect anything. You know, there's a wonderful story about um, the Tin Pan Alley songwriter, Sammy Kahn. Somebody once said to him, what came first, Mr. Kahn, the words of the music? And he said, the phone call. And that was my career. I just, somebody said, do you want to run a labor board? Sure. I didn't know anything about labor law, but I learned. Do you want to teach at McGill? Do you want to run the Law Reform Commission? Do you want to be a family court judge? All of that, I said yes to. So I can't, I, I decided to accept what were wonderful opportunities for me because I didn't have an end goal. I didn't say one day I want to be on the Court of Appeal or on the Supreme Court of Canada. I would have said no to everything that represented risk of controversy. And instead, and instead, all I've had is a career full of controversy where people warned me not to do those things, not to make those decisions. Many of them were gay rights decisions. And I said, what? They're not going to put me on the Supreme Court? I'm not gunning for the Supreme Court of Canada. So I was free to enjoy every single phase of my life that was legally related and personally related, and I have no regrets. I know how lucky I am, Andrew. Joan. And look, yes. look at well, the friends. Look at the friends I've picked up along the way. Look at this incredible Joan Dyson. He's a rock star, and I can say he's my friend. <laughs> well. As with so many other things, I, I find myself agreeing with, with Rosie in many ways. Um, I, I didn't have a, a kind of blueprint for my career, and I responded to opportunities, as she's described, I responded to opportunities as they presented themselves. And I, uh, I mean, the first one that I can think of was actually um, moving from my very comfortable life in my first set of chambers to become head of some other set of chambers, which was much less good set, but which had, uh, I thought, um, possibilities of my branching out and doing other things. It was, a, looking back on it, it was probably a rather foolhardy decision to make. And a number of people said at the time, gosh, you, you are brave. And that word brave was a bit of a chilling word for me. But, and, and then uh, from then on, I mean, everything else sort of was just an opportunity that that cropped up, and and I I've always been a, a believer in seizing opportunities. I, I I've always felt that if I said no to something and just played safe and stuck to what I was still doing, that I would have always regretted what what if would have been the question, and I I didn't want that. So so although it, you know I, uh, in a quiet sort of way perhaps I don't make a lot of noise, but I am actually uh, quite determined and and quite, quite willing to stick my neck out and and do things, and and it has worked. Um, I thought I, I wasn't sure when I heard your question whether the question was restricted to any regrets in my life or our lives as lawyers, um, and I think it probably was. But um, if I had had the talent. Um, and could have my life all over again, I would have loved to have been a concert pianist, but I never had that talent. Um, but that for me would have been, I, I, I didn't want to be a, an international footballer. I did in my young days want to be a, a brilliant cricketer, but I had those dreams about playing cricket are ones which are shared by many people. We tend to grow out of those things. Um, but I would have loved to have been a really outstanding pianist, but I just didn't have the talent. Well, now, can I turn to a, a, a more specific legal question? And I'd like to begin by directing it to Master Bella. In Canada, for all indictable offences, including murder, there is a, a right for the defence to opt for a judge alone trial rather than a trial by jury. And what is said by Laura Ho Hoyano who asked the question is that in practice that enhances appeal rights because a judge sitting alone has to deliver a reasoned judgment. Um, what do you think about um, uh, that, that option? And John, do you think it's something that should be made available in this jurisdiction? Oh my goodness. I mean, it, don't get me started on, on the merits of the jury system. I mean, I, there's a whole topic that we haven't got time to cover, and that is 
what does access to justice really mean and do jury trials enhance it? Or is it a relic of the days when we think uh, jury of our peers means something? I don't know who peers are anymore. So it's, um, that, that's a controversial area and I, I don't know how John feels about it, but it, it's, a, it's a mainstay. And if somebody tries to be, uh, wants to be tried by a judge alone, that really goes into the question of, I mean, I'm trying to interpret the question, is the question, do we need jury trials at all? Or is the question, should people be able to opt out of jury trials? Maybe I misunderstood. It's the latter, I think, that's being put in the question in the way that it was phrased. Now that depends on how romantic you are about jury trials. I mean, Israel doesn't have them. Um, and it's a set of beliefs that are so deep rooted in, in uh, England's DNA, and I suspect in my country too, that it's gonna be very hard to get rid of. It's the notion of democracy in a courtroom, right? But I, I, I don't know, John, what do you feel? Well, as you say, the, the question of whether we should have jury trials at all is a, is a big and controversial one. Uh, I um, was the first judge uh, to serve um, as a juror when they changed the law in this country back in the about 2005 or, or, or thereabouts. So I've seen what it's like to be on a jury. I've also presided over jury trials and seen perverse verdicts. Those who are supporters of juries say that, um, that that can be quite a good thing because juries have a can, can bring a, a broader sense of justice to the, the decision than a, a judge ever could. Uh, I, I don't like that idea because, because I think the law should be certain and I, I, the whole idea of, of encouraging or, or um, endorsing or condoning uh, perverse verdicts um, really strikes me as being uh, a bad idea. But I, I think the question, as, as Andrew says, the question we're being asked really is not so much what we think about the jury system as a whole, whether given that we have a jury system, uh, how do we feel about the, the defendant having the option to, have a, to go for a trial by judge alone? I mean, at the, at the moment, we, we do in, in England, unless things have changed very recently with, as it were, behind my back, um, the uh, uh, defendants do have the option to uh, choose between jury trials and not jury trials in criminal cases uh, in the um, either way offences, the, the sort of middle ranking criminal offences. Uh, and I, I, find, I find that a rather strange idea that, ju that defendants should be able to choose. I mean, either the, the jury system is a good system which we should retain uh, with, with um, clear um, rules that everyone can understand and can apply, or we don't. And the idea that a defendant should be able to choose, I, I find that um, deeply unsatisfactory. And if it's, if, and I certainly that is my view when it comes to choosing whether you have a, a trial before magistrates uh, for the either way offences or a jury trial uh, in those cases. Uh, it, it's, I, I think I'm, I have to, be, to, to reach the same conclusion in answer to the particular question that we've been asked to consider uh, in relation to um, murder cases. So I think my, my, I don't like the idea of giving defendants the choice. I think the state should decide what is the right system for deciding different kinds of cases, and that those should be applied. You may say that's being a bit rigid, but um, I, I, I just don't like the uncertainty. Well, now, my last question to you, because I see the time, is this. Um, what can the legal profession do better to ensure that lawyers and judges reflect our diverse society? What further work could be done to achieve that objective. Rosie. Oh, everything. I think we're, there's so much that needs still to be done. I think we are farther ahead in Canada because of enormous social pressures. Most 
mostly from the United States in the 60s, which pushed it to Canada in the 70s. And then with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, we had constitutionalized protections. It makes a huge difference when people now have not just rights, but constitutionally protected rights. So we've moved a long way towards increasing diversity in a whole bunch of areas. And it's been often through litigation and through judicial decisions that we've been able to advance. That's just one route, but it has to be something, I think the days of saying it's voluntary, let's just let time look after these things, uh, it's not going to change attitudes, or if it does, it changes things too slowly. I think the key, frankly, is to change behavior, because when you change behavior, the attitudes will follow. So there should be requirements, not quotas. I mean, I don't think anybody Jewish is really comfortable with quotas, because they used to keep us out of institutions, countries. Um, but I think there have to be mandatory requirements that the rate of change of the inclusion of people from formerly underrepresented groups occupy the mainstream. So they don't get a slice of the pie, they get access to the whole pie. That's always controversial because you're changing people's sense of entitlement. Um, when it used to be theirs and now they have to share, that's very hard. But unless you have a society that is reflected in all of its institutions, all of its governing institutions, um, you will not have people feeling that they belong into that society. And when you have people who feel they are excluded, then you have the kinds of grievances that grow into uh, social discontent that you see all over the place. So I think uh, the beginning is always good, but it tends to be too slow because people say, well, give it time, it'll happen on its own. It doesn't. You get one here and one there and two there, but you need fundamental change. And that has to come from the requirement. Uh, the leadership has to demand it and mandatory measures have to be in place. John. Well, uh, I think maybe on this one, Rosie and I don't entirely agree. agree. <laughs> um, I, I clearly, I, I, I agree with her that uh, it is essential that the uh, profession, uh, the legal profession and the, the judicial profession uh, should be, should reflect the diversity of society. And in our country, that doesn't happen enough, by any means, enough. And the question is, what do you do about it? Um, I, I'm reluctant to have mandatory requirements uh, I think uh, I, th I think in our country uh, there has been a lot of progress. Actually, I mean, uh, Rosie won't agree with this, but I, I think there has been a lot of progress, particularly so far as women are concerned. Of course, we all would all like to see this happen more quickly, uh, but it, it ha in my professional life the changes have been dramatic. Um, I think so far, and the uh, ethnic uh, communities are now much better represented, or some of them are. Uh, the um, Asian communities are much better represented. The uh, African, uh, the Black African, West Indian ones are not, and that is a problem. And I think that the, uh, the, the schools and universities have a, a big part to play here in educating them at that level uh, to, to educate them, to raise their their expectations and their ambitions and aspirations. Now, I think education has an enormous amount of part to play. I think that a, a more can be done and should be done uh, to encourage people to go out and encourage people to apply for these posts. Uh, um, but I'm, I'm reluctant. I, I think mandatory um, quotas, I, I'm, I'm not convinced about that. Not quotas, I agree with you just my mandatory requirements that the rate of change changes. And it's not reverse discrimination, it's reversing discrimination. But I know this is a very, very uh, delicate topic and reasonable people can disagree. Well, can I mention one thing I think that you will both agree on, that this in uh, 12 years ago set up a scheme called Access to the Bar. And it was one that David Bean, Master David Bean and I set up, and we made eight awards from people who did not come from traditional backgrounds. 
and it was financed in a way that enabled them to spend time with a judge and with a QC to see that the bar was a place that would welcome them as much as it would anybody else. Over that 12 years, it has grown like topsy. And we've gone right. from eight to 25 awards. We've had support from the uh, special interest bar associations, and it has been a magnificent success because now you can see those very people getting those awards, becoming pupils, getting scholarships, developing a practice and being successful tenants. And that is very heartening and reassuring. And it, it seems like that, that have now been adopted by all the inns that are starting to make a marked improvement. So I think that that is one way where you don't do see a tangible benefit and long may those prosper because I think it's very important that the bar is representative of the people that they are looking after. And the bench. So can I just end by saying what a treat. Uh, there have been many messages on the chat and let me just read one. It says, thank you for such uplifting and inspirational conversation and I heartily endorse that. It has been a true pleasure. The wonders of modern technology have enabled both of you to exchange and reminisce in a way that has been a huge benefit for the 141 people who attended this evening's event. So can I, on behalf of everybody and on behalf of the inn in particular, thank you very much for all you've done for being such great masters of the bench and for helping us out this evening. Thank you very much. Thank oh, you very thanks. Much. What an honor to be here. Thank you. Bye, Andrew. Bye, John. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you very Bye. much. Bye, Bye, Bye. everybody.